House of the Dragon is the new series set in the world of George R. R. Martin's Westeros, set centuries before the events of Game of Thrones, or as the show kind of ham-fistedly points out, 172 years before Daenerys Targaryen. It's based on his book, Fire and Blood, which is this history book of the Targaryen rulers across the ages, with different accounts of the same events, but in particular, it spends a lot of time talking about a succession crisis and Targaryen civil war known as the Dance of the Dragons, with just as much politicking, manipulation, and hopefully a great deal less moving chairs around. The only thing that could tear down the House of the Dragon was itself. And honestly, from what I've seen so far, I'm pretty damn sold and I want to break down what happened in episode one. What did you think though of the premiere? Tell me down below and subscribe to the second channel for more content like this. In Fire and Blood, we read the seeds of war are oft planted during times of peace. And episode one is all about sowing the seeds of that civil war in the decades to come. The first seed was sown 30 years before the dance. Episode 1 opens with the Grand Council, this huge, weighty, momentous event brought together to decide who would succeed King Jaehaerys. But the show doesn't quite get it right with what happened here. The show paints this as a decision between Rhaenys and Viserys, the eldest born and the eldest born son. In reality, it was a bit more complicated than that. While it's true that Princess Rhaenys and her daughter were ruled out on account of their sex, she wasn't really considered as one of the two final candidates, like it says. King Jaehaerys' first and second sons were both dead at the time of this council, but they left behind descendants. Leonor Targaryen was the great-grandson of the king and the descendant of his first-born son through Rhaenys, while Viserys Targaryen was the descendant of his second-born son but he's only the grandson of the king. The principle of primogeniture favoured Leonor, but the principle of proximity for Ceres. However, the fact that Leonor's claim passed through his mother, Rhaenys, did make it weaker. That's definitely a part of it. The Ceres was also said to be the last person to ride Beleriand, Aegon the Conqueror's huge black dragon. See, symbols are important to the Targaryens, and this isn't the last time in history that having a symbolic connection to Aegon the Conqueror strengthens someone's claim to the throne. Generations later, King Aegon gives Daemon Waters the Valerian steel sword of Aegon the Conqueror, Blackfire, and this spurs a rebellion as Daemon feels that it makes him the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. This is different to the Daemon we have here and our Doctor Who friend, who, I gotta admit, doesn't actually look as bad as I thought he would in a Targaryen wig, I'm just used to a fez. But this is the precedent that Corlys Valerion refers to in episode 1, that the Iron Throne could not pass to a woman nor through a woman to her male descendants, that it cannot pass to Leonor nor Rhaenyra. And this is really a core idea in the story, it explains a lot of what we see. This is why Daemon is so under the impression that he is next in line as the king's brother, that Viserys is so determined to have a son, why Rhaenys is referred to as the queen who never was, and that it's so controversial that Viserys names Rhaenyra his heir at the end of the episode. While it was never technically made a law that a woman couldn't become queen, nor it could pass through a woman, it created this expectation amongst the lords of Westeros, and it stirs the pot of war to come. Westeros is fundamentally built like feudal Europe, it's patriarchal, and having a queen it mentions could throw a lot of lords' own entitlements into doubt. It's no wonder they don't want it. So the writers did simplify this conflict down to being about sex, and honestly, I'm not that worried, I think it's fine, like it was predominantly about that in the book as well, it was a major part of this conflict, and it would have been really hard to explain very quickly how this incestuous cesspool of a family tree called the Targaryens even works. I mean, there are, there are characters who are dead by this point that I'd have to name and explain and talk about all the different types of claims to the throne. No, it, it wouldn't have worked. Fire and Blood really does explore the women's role in Westerosi society. It comes up repeatedly. So this is, I think, a pretty fair simplification to make of the story. 
The rest of the episode is set decades before the dance, but long after that council, and it sets up the characters and conflicts to come. There's a lot of small council scenes and interplay at the tourney that are full of subtext and conflict that's all boiling underneath the surface. The major houses at play in House of the Dragon are the Targaryens, the Hightowers, and the Valerions. At the centre of House Targaryen is King Viserys, who is described as not the strongest willed of kings. He relied greatly on the counsel of the men around him, and did as they bade more off than not. In episode 1, we do see this being represented. We see Viserys listening to his small council, letting them make decisions, and multiple times he finds himself kind of unwilling to step in or decide something for himself. He'd rather people just work things out and be happy on their own. And Viserys only really seems to assert himself when it comes to family, like with Daemon and Rhaenyra. At the same time though, he is a king interested in keeping the peace, and he would rather give in than cause conflict. This kind of light power vacuum though does allow other people from the great houses of Westeros to rise in the ranks and find a lot of power of their own. In particular, the Hand of the King, Sir Otto Hightower. The Hightowers are based out of Old Town, one of the oldest and richest houses on the continent, but they typically prefer trade and negotiation to conquest, and Otto very much embodies this. He's a smart, domineering man who thrives on the minutia of ruling Westeros where King Viserys does not, and by this point in the story, he served his hand to three different kings. He's learned and competent, and he believes that thrones are won with quills rather than swords something that becomes immensely important across the dance. But one of the most important rivalries in the court is between Sir Otto and Prince Daemon. Daemon rides the red dragon Caraxes, the bloodworm, and he wields the Valyrian steel blade Dark Sister. He is described as hot-tempered and quarrelsome, as well as impetuous, ambitious, and moody. In the show, Daemon is definitely shown to be all of these things. He's argumentative and provocative. In the tourney, he specifically picks Sir Gwen Hightower, the eldest son of Otto Hightower, the Hand, to lance against, likely because he wants to just humiliate him and Otto indirectly. He even cheats for a cheap victory by aiming at the horse, and this is probably a reference to something that happened in one of the Duncan Egg stories. Later on, he also asks for Alicent Hightower's favour, Otto's daughter, and she gives it to him. This is, again, probably just to spite Otto. In episode 1, Daemon describes Otto as a second son who stands to inherit nothing he doesn't seize for himself. This is, of course, quite ironic, given that is precisely what Daemon is. Otto, as Hand of the King, has already removed Daemon as Master of Coin and Master of Laws in the past. He made him Commander of the City Watch, kind of as a way to get him out of the way. Otto even goes as far to describe the prince as a second Magor the Cruel, or worse, if allowed anywhere near the Iron Throne. And this is a quote we actually see in the episode, but it isn't entirely fair. Daemon has a long story, and I won't spoil his role in the dance, but he's also described as charming, as loyal, and while he is abrasive, he's not necessarily cruel or resentful. His frustration with his brother doesn't seem so much rooted in jealousy as it is a wish that his brother would trust him, and in the show, he very openly says that he just wishes Viserys would keep him by his side as hand instead of sending him away, that he just wants to protect him. He shows loyalty to family in Rhaenyra, with this moment of genuine affection in giving her that Valyrian steel necklace, which, I'm not gonna lie, definitely has some incestuously erotic undertones, but you're just gonna have to get used to that in House of the Dragon. Really sorry, but it's it's just part of it, okay? At the same time, Daemon is a classic Martin Grey character. As Commander of the City Watch, we're told that King's Landing is made a safer place, but his discipline was a brutal one. And we see this brutality in the show, in probably one of the two most shocking scenes, uh, with the cut-off testicles and hands and more testicles, he transforms the City Watch into the gold cloaks we know, giving them new equipment and training and a respect that they never got before. Daemon has a clear sense of right and wrong. He's a man of action. 
and family loyalty above all. This might make him sound a little bit like Tywin Lannister, but he really doesn't have the politicking skills that Tywin did. He's said to have found court and ruling rather boring. Despite King Viserys' attempts to mend this rift between Otto and Daemon, the two men roiled endlessly beneath the false smiles they wore at court. So expect to see a lot of that great subtext that we got in you know seasons one to four. This conflict between Daemon and Otto Hightower is ripe for the machinations that we will see later on, as these two men vie for influence and power, and who knows, maybe putting him in charge of 2,000 competent soldiers in King's Landing might have been a bad idea for Otto, something that they definitely foreshadow in the opening episode. A third man who rises during the series' time is Corlys Valerion, better known as the Sea Snake. As brilliant as he was restless, as adventurous as he was ambitious, a natural sailor. He's kind of the Ned Stark of the dance, though without any of the humility. He's a man who sticks by his word and has a strong sense of right and wrong and entitlements. The Valerions and Targaryens have a long, intimate history, in the very literal sense. The Valerions are based on Driftmark, an island near Dragonstone, and they've long been allies of the Targaryens, having ferried Aegon soldiers over in the first place. They too came from Old Valeria at some point in the past. While they don't have a lot of strength on the continent itself, they are a naval power, and the dance is described as a conflict where much of the slaughter took place on water. Corlys married Rhaenys Targaryen, the cousin of King Viserys, and the woman who was passed over for the throne in the Grand Council that we saw at the start of the episode. Corlys, by the way, was infuriated when both Rhaenys and Leonor, his son, was passed over at this council, and he quit the small council. He gave up his admiralty, which was basically unheard of at the time. This was a real fracturing as were the Baratheons, because Rainey's mother was a Baratheon. Though Corlys is the one to point out that Daemon is currently in line for the throne, this may have been to prompt a change in the series, to challenge that assumption again, and to use Otto's dislike for the man to have Rhaenyra named heir instead. Though, I want to be clear, this shouldn't be mistaken for Corlys being like super progressive or anything. Corlys is an ambitious man, and even after making the Valerians one of the richest and most influential houses on the continent by doing these huge voyages across the world and bringing back expensive materials and spices from the Far East, he still wants more, and he's going to stop at nothing to see one of his own blood on the Iron Throne. So. Again, we're seeing a lot of allegiances and lines drawn in the sand, motivations and inclinations that set a lot of different characters on a collision course for the future, for better and worse. Daemon and Otto, Daemon and Viserys, Daemon and Corlys, Daemon and Sir Kristen Cole, Daemon and everyone, but also Alicent and Rhaenyra, Viserys and Otto and Corlys. Cards are being played close to the chest but the day will come when they need to go down on the table. The show doesn't really have an opening credits the way that we know them. There's this one which is very brief, and apparently we'll get a full one in episode two. The one for the first episode though depicts a Targaryen symbol in gold, which is an interesting choice because during the Dance of the Dragons, the two factions of Targaryens are split between the Greens and the Blacks and the Greens take a golden dragon for their banner. We then get a huge shot of Rhaenyra flying through the sky with her dragon, Cyrax. Some 21 dragons are involved to some degree or another across the dance, and I gotta admit, I was kinda worried that they were gonna rely on spectacle a bit too much, but I was really pleased that the dragons are included in the episode in really subtle ways. They're very much background characters. You know, we only see two dragons in the opening episode, Rhaenyra Cyrax and Daemon's Caraxes, and they get very little screen time. They really add to the flavor and texture of the show, but the story is very much about that complex political interplay that we really love. Apparently we will see nine dragons across the first season, but I think that so far they've handled them really well. We also get this shot of a huge building in the distance, and this is the Dragon Pit. It's an important location in the dance, it's a huge stable for dragons, 
And you'll remember in Game of Thrones that it lay in ruins. Who knows, maybe we'll find out exactly how that happens. We also see the Dragon Keepers, and in the books they're described as 77 strong and clad in suits of gleaming black armor, their helms crested by a row of dragon scales. But here, they seem to be dressed almost monkish. I suppose this stuff would do just as well to defend them against dragon fire as armor would. It's quite fitting that they use these huge, well they're not spears, but large sticks. It kind of brings to memory how we have trained and treated elephants in the past. It's not nice, but it does have a uh, kind of a nice realism to it, I think. If I remember rightly, people will often train huge animals with like legitimately sharp objects, like they might have used spears, but then later on they use, you know, like dull versions or blunted versions or just sticks that sort of symbolize them and the animal doesn't quite know the difference between them. So that might be what we're seeing here with these huge sticks that they did train them in the past with spears, which is kind of horrible to think about, but we don't know. We see a lot of the first episode though through the eyes of Rhaenyra and her friend Alicent. Alicent Hightower, the daughter of Otto, the Hand of the King. In the books, Alicent is actually nine years older than Rhaenyra, and we don't know that much about their relationship. We know that they got along for a little while, but the amity between Alicent and Rhaenyra had proved short-lived, as these conflicts that we're gonna see in the future boil over. But I reckon that they made this change because they're probably going for a tragic tale of friendship that falls apart as the realm descends into civil war. See, Fire and Blood is a history book, but it is scant on detail at times, so there's a lot of room for this show to move, and with George at the helm, I think he's going to do a pretty good job. Even though this is a change, I think it's a good one. While they're both young at the moment, so much of the latest story revolves around these two fascinating characters, and having them be friends originally honestly just builds on the material that was already there, and it makes it more personal. And that's the thing about the Dance of the Dragon, right? The whole conflict is incredibly personal. It's a lot less about house versus house and more about person versus person. It's got personal vendettas and betrayals and this really feeds into those elements really well. I don't just want to be faithful for faithfulness' sake necessarily. Like, it's not like this change has actually taken anything away because we don't really know much about them in the first place. Rhaenyra though is described as a precocious child, bright and bold and beautiful. She is called the realm's delight, but honestly we don't get that much else about her as a child, so there is a lot of room to move and develop her character, and honestly I think they did that really well in episode 1. People are comparing her to Daenerys, and I guess they're right in some abstract senses that I won't share because spoilers, but she is a fundamentally different character. I really liked that she didn't really seem that interested in ruling at the start. You know, Viserys names her heir, but she's kind of take it or leave it in a way. She's adventurous and free-spirited. Alicent, on the other hand, contrasts with Rhaenyra. She's a rule follower, pressing Rhaenyra to do her studies, and when Rhaenyra offers to take her up on a dragon, she says she's quite content as a spectator. In the books, Alicent is only ever really described as lovely and clever as a child, but this lawful goodness is a really fantastic expansion on her character that really does set up her role to come. Alicent does also bite her nails quite viciously, we see that a couple of points in the episode to the point of wounding herself, so this may be a kind of self-harm, maybe she has self-destructive tendencies, and I think it'll be really interesting to see where she goes with that character. So again, they're taking these characters where we don't have a lot of information on them, and they're building them out in ways that I think are really effective. It's loyal to the spirit of the books, and I think that's the more important part. See, Fire and Blood is written like a history book put together by a maester, who is compiling different versions of the same historical events, primarily from three different sources a septon, a maester, and a jester. There's a lot of room for the story to expand and give detail where the book does not, and we're going to be able to see as we watch the show which account of these different stories are correct. Like, the septon tends to give a sanitized version of events, while the jester, Mushroom, tends to give the salacious elements, which mostly just adds up to everyone having sex with everyone else, but this does bring us back to Alicent. 
after Queen Emma dies and that honestly rather horrific cesarean scene, we'll get back to that soon, Otto sends his daughter Alicent to comfort the king. Alicent softly protests to ask if her father means in the king's private bedchamber and Otto insists that the king would appreciate the company and he tells her that she might want to put on one of her mother's dresses. Mushroom's account of this event is a great deal more salacious, as promised, that she welcomed King Viserys into her bed even before Queen Emma's death, and he goes so far as to claim that reading was not his only service Alicent performed for the old king, that supposedly Otto sent his daughter to him with this sexual subtext in mind and to encourage him to pick her as his new wife. While Alicent certainly wasn't with Viserys before Emma died, as Mushroom claims, it seems part of these rumours were true in a way. Otto's instruction to wear her mother's dress suggests that he wanted her to appear more as a woman rather than a girl, and Alicent's question suggests that even she is aware of the adult subtext of this visit. So there's going to be a lot of this, figuring out which version of these different events are true and where there are expansions on the few details available. But it goes even further than that because Fire and Blood is written by unreliable narrators, even the maester compiling them himself, so there's actually no saying that any versions in the book are wholly correct, and all of them are going to miss details or context to some degree. Especially with Martin involved in the show, you know, it gets even muddier if he retcons it, does that mean that it's technically true? I don't know. Saying something isn't accurate to the books doesn't really have the same weight as a criticism here, because Fire and Blood just isn't an objective account of these events, so keep that in mind going forward. Just because it's not in the books doesn't mean that Martin didn't intend it or that it's a change, and certainly not necessarily a bad change. After following Rhaenyra and Alicent across the city for a while, we see Viserys being treated for a wound on his back. He calls it a small cut from sitting the throne. The Iron Throne was forged from the thousands of swords of Aegon the Conqueror's defeated, and it's said that cutting yourself on the Iron Throne is a sign of your downfall. Cuts were seen upon their legs and the palm of their left hand, the Iron Throne had spurned them, and their days upon it would be few. Magor the Cruel was a particularly bad and short-lived king, and he was found dead and bloodied on the Iron Throne. Many to this day believe it was the Iron Throne itself that killed him. But this is largely superstition. It's likely that all kings cut themselves on the throne at some point, and that's what we're seeing with Viserys. We see this in the original show with Daenerys. She pricks herself on the throne, and of course, has a very short time on it. We see a fair amount of Viserys and his wife Emma. Now, we know very little, like nothing about Emma in the books, and it's really great that they managed to get us to really care about these two as a couple in so little time in episode one, especially because Emma dies so soon after. She was born in the Vale, and the show does tell us that she supports the idea of a woman claiming the throne. Again, that suggests where the veil might fall in a conflict around that question in the future. Emma tells Rhaenyra early on in the episode that childbirth is our battlefield, and that proves unfortunately true when she dies in childbirth halfway through the episode in an incredibly uncomfortable scene to watch as she is basically cut open for a caesarean without her consent. It really could be called murder. And like how peasants don't choose to die in the war of others, Emma is forcibly cut open, and she dies from the blood loss. The child doesn't even go on to live. There's a cruel irony in that. Now, this particular scene isn't actually in the books, but it is exactly the sort of thing that our unreliable narrators either would not know or would simply omit. It certainly doesn't paint King Viserys or the Grand Maester in a particularly good light. Viserys has a lot of complicated relationships, and these are kind of front and center in that first episode. We see how Viserys defends Daemon repeatedly from Otto's criticisms, angrily repudiating any suggestion that his brother would betray him and try and take the throne. Still, Daemon really does cause a strain on their relationship. Daemon refers to his wife in the Vale as his bronze bitch after the bronze armor of House Royce, and prior to the show, Daemon even tried to have this marriage set aside. 
He then goes on to say, in the middle of a small council meeting, men are said to fuck sheep instead of women. Which, you know what? As a New Zealander, I've heard that plenty of times before. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> But it's alright because only Australians say it and Australians are all lying criminals. Both of these are direct quotes from the books and I was really glad to see them. Viserys admits that Daemon makes a sport of provoking Otto, the Hand of the King, and he seems like the only one keeping these two from going at each other's throats. This tension between Viserys and his brother though comes to a head later in the episode when the King gets word that Daemon described his dead son as the heir for a day the taverns and whorehouses of King's Landing. Now, I gotta admit, I didn't expect this event to happen so soon. That is one thing I really did notice with episode one. It's very uh, fast paced. You're really just thrown into the events of the, of the story. There's this real sense of things already being in motion. But either way, Viserys sends Daemon away back to the Vale to be with his actual wife and Daemon angrily protests that all he's ever wanted is to be by his brother's side. This is a, I think, pretty faithful rendition of the relationship that Viserys and Daemon have. We see that ferocity that comes out around family. Fire and Blood does tell this story a little bit differently though. That it wasn't Viserys who sent Daemon away, but Daemon left once Rhaenyra was appointed Viserys' new heir. Prince Daemon was not at the ceremony, however. Furious at the king's decree, the prince quit King's Landing, taking his paramour Massaria with him upon the back of his dragon Caraxes. And it was only after this that King Viserys sent him back to his lawful wife. So the events are all there, but it's in a slightly different order, with more of an emphasis on Daemon as this antagonistic element opposed to Rhaenyra at the start than we see in the show. This is, again, a sort of change that is totally understandable and reflects the different ways that we view history and that it can be collated. One of the details you might have missed is this woman, one of the girls Damon talks to in the brothel. She doesn't seem that important in episode one, but her name is Massaria, though her rivals and enemies call her Misery, the White Worm. Again, the first episode is introducing all the important players to come, even if you miss them. Massaria is conniving, manipulative, closer to a Varys or Peter Baelish character, and where her allegiances lie is never exactly clear. But she knows how to play those around her against each other, a skill that becomes ever more important in the Dance of Dragons in the years to come. A decent chunk of this episode swaps between two scenes, between that of the birth and of the tourney to celebrate Viserys supposed son coming into the world. But some of the events didn't actually happen as we see them at this time. It is true that Sir Criston Cole won the melee held at Maidenpool and knocked Dark Sister from Prince Daemon's hand with his Morning Star, but this happened when Viserys ascended to the throne nine years before this. Now, I gotta be honest, I don't have any problem with this change either. We wouldn't have seen that event otherwise, and it's a great moment to set up the complex, interpersonal relationship between Rhaenyra, who he asks for the favor of, Daemon, and Criston Cole. It's also the sort of thing that doesn't really feel out of place. It's involving details from the book in a way that they can, basically. The end of episode one is probably the most controversial part, and the part that I am most lukewarm on. By this point, Viserys is mourning. Both his wife, Emma, and his son are dead, and he has no heir. Still furious at Daemon's betrayal and seeing things anew, he appoints Rhaenyra his heir. And when he does this, he tells her of a prophecy. Aegon the Conqueror foresaw the end of the world of men and the world of the living. When this great winter comes, all of Westeros must stand against it, and a Targaryen must be seated on the Iron Throne. Aegon called his dream the Song of Ice and Fire. This secret has been passed from king to heir since Aegon's time. Okay, there is a lot to talk about with this. Like, it's true that the Targaryens are known to have prophetic dreams. Daenys Targaryen foresaw the doom of Valyria and allowed them to escape it because they left. It's clearly a reference to the Long Night, when the Others and their army of the undead come down from the north, as we saw in Game of Thrones and as we're seeing it play out in the books. But if this is the case, 
why keep it a secret? Why only pass it from air to air? If it's so important, why not prepare the realm for this eventuality? What's the benefit to keeping the secret? There's a lot of world building questions I feel spring from this. I feel like it also kind of muddies the waters of Aegon's original conquest and Daenerys' story later on by introducing this kind of chosen one element, something that feels very not George R. R. Martin and kind of the antithesis of a lot of his storytelling. I mean, I don't know, I'm not the one writing the books, but it feels off. Calling it a song of ice and fire feels very prequel to me, especially considering the series has the knife that Arya will later use to kill the Night King. And I have always kind of hated that need for everything to be explained, you know, where everything came from. You can see this in Star Wars all the time where there's an explanation for how every tiny little part of the story came to be. It's just not that great and it robs the story of all its little questions by giving just bad answers. On the one hand, this connects House of the Dragon to one of the worst elements of the original series, which might put a lot of people off, but this show isn't done by the same writers and it's referencing the lore and we don't know what the plans are, so not the original show. It felt like an odd note to end on, especially because, at least in Fire and Blood, there is nothing that comes even close to suggesting that the Others or White Walkers will play any role in this era of history. Then again, if The Long Night was done really well in the original series, maybe this wouldn't feel weird, maybe this would feel like a cool connection. I don't really know how I would feel about it. I guess at the moment I can only hope that it was only really intended to signify the series choosing Rhaenyra as his heir and hope they won't dwell on it too much in the future, especially because I don't really know what they could even do with that piece of information. But I'm not going to think too much on it because it is a relatively small detail in otherwise a really successful episode. The episode closes with all the lords and ladies from across Westeros swearing to defend Rhaenyra's claim to the throne including the High Towers, the Vale, Rickon Stark, Boron Baratheon, and Corlys Valerion. The dance is full of oaths being taken, sworn, and broken. Kingsguard and Grand Maesters and Night's Watchmen and Kings and Queens and Treaties. We'll have to wait and see which of these oaths are kept. Now, I do have a slight problem. You know, I'm not sure I want to bombard the main channel with this kind of content every single week, so unless it does really well on here, I don't really know, I'm probably going to upload future episodes discussing House of the Dragon and Rings of Power, by the way, to my second channel, to the future, which you can subscribe to at the link below. Overall, I really enjoyed House of the Dragon. I give it a solid rating. We've got this politics and machinations and relationships and conflicts and interesting characters and places and promises of stories to come with the seeds of war being planted early. It feels like that season one to four of Game of Thrones, and the characters are played extremely well, very well cast, uh, it, 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 it's interesting in the way that we really want this kind of story to be. It's fascinating and, I'm, and I can't wait to see where it goes and how they grow, do go watch it if you haven't already. In the meantime, stay nerdy and I'll see you in the future. Thank <laughs> you.